أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد بعثنا في كل أمة رسولا أن يبدو الله وجتنب الطاغوت فمنهم من حد الله ومنهم من حقت عليه الضلالة فسيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاقبة المكذبين الله سبحانه وتعالى says for we assuredly sent amongst every people a messenger with the command, serve Allah and eschew evil. Of the people were some whom Allah guided and some on whom error became inevitably established. So travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who denied the truth. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another edition of Islam for Europeans. Um, and I wanted to make this episode um, on the topic of why... Um, almost all of our detractors have been other white converts. Okay, and I didn't want to make this as a diatribe or to call out somebody or as a clapback. I'm not referring to any one specific individual. Um, but what we've been noticing is at Islam for Europeans that um, we've been getting an overwhelming amount of support um, from, from Muslims from all walks of life, um, whether that's the African-American community uh, or the Arab community or the South Asian community. Um, they all seem to have a lot of really uh, a positive feedback. However, the only detractors, um, you know, while we've been running this you know, thing for the last five years, um, has been almost exclusively other white converts. So I wanted to get into the reasons why I think this is, um, and also as an appeal to reach out to my fellow um, converts to Islam of European descent um, to you know, to call them to at least, you know, support our idea if they want to join our organization um, or at the very least provide food for thought. And I know some people who are watching this who are other white converts, they may have had their disagreements with me in the past. Um, but at least after this video, if you watch it, if you can at least say, look, I don't agree with your opinion, Rob. Uh, but at the same time, I, I can understand where you're coming from. Um, that at the least, you know, will provide at least, you know, uh, food for thought. Okay, um, so before I begin, because I, I, a lot of people don't know, you know, what exactly we're about, um, and because, you know, this is such a sensitive topic, I wanted to talk about our concepts um, at Islam for Europeans and our recommendation uh, to Muslim communities throughout the West. So what we're advocating for is that um, converts to Islam uh, from European descent, and by extension, any other group of converts, um, should collectivize um, and form a, a sub-community. And this sub-community will be a greater part of the of the greater Muslim community. And we are not separating ourselves from the greater Muslim community. Um, we are still going to give all the Muslims uh, their Islamic rights. Uh, we are going to advocate for the safety and security of Muslims living in the West. Uh, however, we need to form uh, these sub-communities in order to, A, um, you know, be able to better coordinate uh, so people who convert to Islam from our culture will have a much easier time getting acclimated. Uh, B, uh, to be able to better give dawah to our people and C, so that uh, these sub-communities can um, uh, get rid of the uh, degenerate or un-Islamic things in their culture while at the same time um, returning to or keeping the good things in their culture. Um, so returning to the traditional dress, uh, the traditional cuisine, the architecture, the sports and games. Um, and in order to do this, uh, we need to collectivize and basically form a wolf pack uh, with our own centers or own organizations or own restaurants. <clears throat> and all Muslims would be invited to our, to our centers as well if they wanted to pray there and everything. But uh, the culture should be reflective of the people. Okay. Um, so that's basically it. And, you know, um, and, you know, so hopefully that... <laughs> uh you know um resolves a lot of these straw man arguments but in order to better understand this um we have to understand that you know we have to realize that there are certain differences between westerners who are interested in islam or westerners who have actually converted to islam but haven't um joined a, a muslim community or expressed their shahada publicly um and the third group is westerners who not only convert to islam but as basically joined or assimilated into an existent uh, Muslim community. And that was me. I converted in 2003. So I was basically just like everybody else. Um, you know, I didn't hold these opinions beforehand. Um, 
but for me, like many other commerce, I basically had to live in two worlds. I had the Muslim community in Windsor, you know, which Arabs, South Asians, and Somalis uh, were the superior majority, super majority among the Muslim community. And my white family and community uh, in my hometown was another sphere. And these two spheres basically never interacted. Okay, for most white converts uh, that you see uh, who have become these visible advocates or saviors from the Muslim community um, or influencers, uh, those are the only ones that you actually see. You don't see, so it basically is like a selection bias, right? So um, you have to understand that converting to Islam uh, as someone from European descent, you basically have no, no one in your friends or family members who are Muslim, right? And when you convert, you will be seen as going against the culture uh, of your community, whether or not the reaction from your family is either positive or negative, right? The immigrant um, or a first gen Muslim community, um, you know, they're very accepting and they're very warm and welcoming. And, you know, they give you a hug after you take your Shahada. And I, you can tell they de desperately want to help these converts out. But I think the way they've been doing it um, has been a square peg for a round hole. They put, usually if it's a brother, they put this brother up on a pedestal. Um, they give him all these advantageous positions in the Muslim community that he's really not qualified for. Um, or, you know, if, you know, you're living in the online world, a lot of these new converts will just become, you know, Muslim influencers um, or dais basically overnight. Um, but I would say in general that the Muslim community has this kind of overpraising uh, of the, the white convert in an attempt to try to acclimate them uh, to the Muslim community. Okay? But while all this is going on at the masjid with your friends and your family, it's a different world. Okay, Whether or not your family has accepted your conversion, the Muslim community um, simply does not have the tools uh, to allay your family's fears about Islam. And even if they did, even if you, know, you had the most well-educated imam in the world, oftentimes the convert's family is not going to be willing to discuss this with the imam um, if the convert has told their family at all, right? So, you know, you could have the most educated men in the world uh, said, okay, how about you reach out to your family or they come to the mosque? Well, the fact of the matter is um, non-Muslim Westerners basically don't want to go to a mosque, you know, by and large, um, even if they have a positive image of Islam, because it's just, it's just not their turf. Right. So um, and even if, you know, you do get the imam or well-educated Muslim to talk to your family for maybe 10, 20, 30 minutes, um, you know, there's no telling if that's going to solve the problem, because, you know, what is a 10, 20, 30 minute conversation going to do compared to the fact that you're living in the Anglosphere and your non-Muslim family is living in the Anglosphere? And, you know, like they're being inundated with these anti-Islam arguments from their family and community 24-7. Right. So <clears throat> to ask the Muslim community to do this is just not feasible. And it leads to, you know, what um, a lot of Muslims call white supremacy because, you know, they end up spending gobs of money trying to, you know, compensate for the fact that this this brother has lost, um, you know, has all this social loss or this or the sister in Islam. OK, um, so like I said, black converts to Islam, they're in a very different situation. And this is what they tell me. They don't get the same white savior status. Uh, that they do when it comes to, um, I guess, the immigrant masjids. And, you know, there, you can think about several reasons why this is, you know, you know, one possible reason is that when, I guess, first-gen Muslims look at African-American converts, you know, in their eyes, they think, well, Black people are already, quote-unquote, on our side. You know, they're not the, these white Islamophobes. So there's no real, and they already have a sub-community. So there's no real reason. I mean, we provide these resources, but usually they don't reach out and, you know, use these resources in the first place. I mean, there are other issues as well. I mean, a lot of African-American masters have totally shut down because the, you know, a lot of uh, masters built by the Arab and South Asian community have gobs of money and they ended up, you know, taking all the resources. Um, and also with black converts to Islam, they may have one or several family members that are already Muslim, right? Or even if they're the only Muslim in their family, Islam, it has become a, basically a fabric of the African-American culture. So on average, their family is going to have a much better chance of understanding um, the black Muslim. Not to say that, you know, I'm sure many black Muslims are going through, you know, went through turmoil, um, you know, like maybe, especially if they come from like, you know, a lot of these like black conservative uh, Christian, uh, like pastor communities and stuff. Um, but in general, I mean, for white converts, converts 
to converting to Islam is seen as basically as complete rejection of one's identity and culture. And, you know, a lot of um, Muslim spokespeople actually play into this, you know, saying that, you know, boycott France, boycott UK, boycott Poland, boycott Greece. I mean, like, you know, just um, creating this atmosphere where it's, you know, more and more us versus them. And there's no people in the Anglosphere that are on our side. And the way we get around this is, you know, when white people convert to Islam, they're just not white anymore. Okay, so um, usually when a white person converts to Islam, it's either one of two situations, right? You could have the situation where your family is very liberal and accepting. And usually these are, you know, like Muslims who end up, you know, going very far. Like for me, alhamdulillah, my family had no problem with my conversion to Islam. And you could look at Muslim celebrities such as Hamza Yusuf and Suhaib Webb. Um, you know, if you watch uh, Hamza Yusuf's um, uh, interviewed Jordan Peterson, his family had very little problem with him converting to Islam. So this facilitates the converts to to pursue, to become a scholar, to make hijra, to marry into a Muslim family, to basically assimilate uh, into a totally different uh, culture, right? Um, and, you know, so usually these mosques are usually run by first gen uh, Muslims. They think of the white convert in these terms, right? I mean, that's why they say that converts are so much stronger than us because they think that, you know, when they think of a white convert, they think of Hamza Yusuf or Suhaib Webb or Yusuf Estes, someone who, you know, is very strong in the deen. But what, what's really happening is that um, your average white Westerner who, is, who may be interested in Islam is simply not willing to dive right in uh, and to do all these things that are expected of them, right? So in addition, since we have no cultural identification with Islam, the only thing we have to fall back on is the practice of our faith, right? So. Which, if for your, if for example, if you're a white woman who is not ready to wear the hijab, although she believes that Islam is the truth because of the reaction of her family, maybe she'll get fired from her job, maybe her mother and dad will disown her, maybe she'll get kicked out of the house, she will not feel like uh, she is living up to the Muslim Muslim communities or a loss upon Taala's expectations, you know. But meanwhile, I mean, there are mi basically millions of Muslim women in Muslim families who are not wearing hijab at all. And I'm not saying that to disparage them, but nobody questions that they're not a member of the Muslim community because they belong to a Muslim society, right? So all these factors basically siphon off most Westerners who are interested in Islam. I would say, um, you know, 75 to 80%, leaving only the very strongest uh, white converts to actually convert. Uh, and usually they take on this kind of influencer or white savior role in the Muslim community, right? So bearing that in mind, let's look at the two major narratives that Muslim communities have had regarding the best way forward um, as a Muslim community vis-a-vis -vis the Anglosphere. The first narrative is what I call the Medina model, okay? So I said this in a previous uh, conversation I had with Abdullah and Chris. So this was basically the model of most Muslim communities prior to the 2010s in the West. You know, it's still, um, you still kind of see this model or narrative or zeitgeist within um, different Muslim organizations. Um, and this model, you know, the, the narrative is that the best way to move forward as a Muslim community is to be one united Ummah. Um, and they take this to a, an extreme. Uh, in which the barriers to this are any cultural differences, any disparities between groups, any exclusionary behavior, and any personal preference for one's own nation or culture, especially when it comes to marriage. And they think that any proclivity towards one's own culture or things like that, to the exclusion of other Muslims, is must be due to racism and therefore disunity. In order to move forward as a Muslim community in the West, according to the Medina model, we should downplay any of these cultural differences because we basically only have one culture, quote unquote, Islam. I call this the Medina model because Islamic leadership um, uh, that came from you know, the Muslim countries, they looked at how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, integrated the Mahajirun, the, you know, the original Muslims from Mecca, and the Ansar, the new, um, uh, the new Muslims in Medina, by pairing up new converts in Medina with the Muslims from Mecca, right? So this is what basically what Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did. Also, you had the Aus and the Hazraj, who were basically two previous rival tribes, um, whose uh, people were now united under the banner of Islam, right? So 
what they do a lot of what a lot of Muslim leaders who push the Medina model is that what they do is they simply copy and paste what Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did in Medina in the seventh century, and try to apply that to the to the West in the twentieth and twenty first century. Okay, for example, you know they push total intercult they push they really push intercultural marriage um, as a solution to the racism of preferring to marry within one's own culture. Um, and we saw this a lot when I converted to Islam. It was, uh, you know, like many Arabs would only marry, not even Arabs, you know, people from a Palestinian village would only marry Palestinians from another village. People from Lebanon, from a certain city, would only marry Lebanese from another city. And Pakistanis would only other, marry only other Pakistanis. Um, and for a while, we thought, you know, this was racist, that we need to eliminate this, uh, and therefore we need to, you know, push uh, intercultural marriage as a solution that will bring the Muslim community forward. Um, and there are several other examples. That's the most sensitive one. But, um, you know, I guess why they, you know, I, their thinking is, you know, and it makes sense that this is the only way that the Muslim community will be united is if we follow the Medina model, where Dean should should be the only deciding factor when it comes to marriage, right? Um, and they also tend to reject bad things that Muslims do. And then what they do is they, they call it cultural, right? So, Pakistanis playing cricket outside the mosque, you know, right after Maghrib, after the while the adhan is being called, uh, and missing Maghrib prayer in the masjid, you know that's not because you know they you know they just basically miss Maghrib prayer because they were engaged in sports, but it was because you know playing cricket after Maghrib is quote unquote cultural, right? So you have to understand why this mentality came because a lot of you know, a lot of Muslims believe that the reason why the Ottoman Empire fell um, and the Muslim community is, you know, and is in such shambles uh, in the East is due to disunity. That, you know, there was an Arab revolt started by Lawrence of Arabia, and that basically led to the fall of the Ottoman Empire and, you know, divided up all these uh, Muslims into nation states, right? So what they, you know, you know, their solution to that, you know, because so, and then on top of that, you know, they, a lot of them have been oppressed by nationalist governments. You know, some imams actually personally, you know, they've been jailed by, you know, the Assad government or the Saudi government or what have you. So they have a very anti-nationalist stance and they take it to the most uh, extreme opposite. Right. But when you bring that idea and bring it to the West, it creates a lot of issues because you're not realizing you're not admitting that, you know, we belong to different uh, Muslim communities, different nations, different tribes who have totally different, uh, you know, cultural differences and um, differences in language and the way we do things and, um, you know, just, just, uh, you know, the way the family dynamics work. I mean, you have, I mean, just think about it. You have, you know, like, uh, Syrians who are dealing with displacement from their homeland. You have African Americans who came out of slavery to be the flag bearers of Islam in America, um, who are also facing racism. Um, at the end of the day, when you, even though you try to push the Medina model, it's usually going to be one group that ends up running the show um, in these uh, umbrella masjids. And even though they may think that their approach is the best, and you know they're using this you know pan Islam pan Islamist monocultural approach, they're not going to see the viewpoint of communities that they've never been involved with. Okay, so this model, which Muslims in the West have tried, has mostly failed miserably. And, you know, especially when it comes to white converts who tend to be the greatest proponents of the Medina model. And I think that's because a lot of them, they feel this intense social loss, you know, when they convert to Islam and they want the Muslim community to fulfill that loss. Right. So, um, but at the end of the day, as warm and as welcoming, um, as a mosque can be, um, at the end of the day, they can't replace your family. They can't replace the people you grew up around. And, you know, as much as you want to try to fit in, uh, you know, with, you know, the Pakistani community or the Arab community, um, asking them to fulfill those social gaps, it may work for you, but it's not going to work for the vast majority of Westerners. Okay? Um, so let's talk about why I guess the Medina model really hasn't worked uh, in the West. So I think it's twofold. One is that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was willing to reach out to all of the people in Medina. He was a statesman who was willing to talk to the families of the converts who rejected their family. And the converts had this support system by pairing them with one of the Muhajirun or the Ansar. But Medina, it was a small town in the seventh century, right? 
you know, like, uh, you can't, you can't say that what's going on in Medina in the seventh century, when you had the prophet Muhammad Wasallam and all the Sahaba who are the best nation, may Allah be pleased with them. And somehow you can just copy and paste that to what's going on in the, in the 21st century and, and think that it's going to work when you have all these different sub communities that almost never interact with each other, aside from praying in the same rows. And a lot of these mosques don't even, you know, it's just specific to one culture. You know, like you have your umbrella masjids. You also have masjids that just cater to one specific uh, community. You know, like in Toronto, I went to an Eid prayer and it was outdoors and it was 90% Somalis because the mosque that was run by Somalis organized this Eid event. And a block south of that was an Eid prayer organized by the Pakistani community. And they were literally one block from each other and there was two different Eid prayers, right? So, um. So yeah, that's one thing. And then I think the second reason is that for the most part, even though Medina had rival tribes and you had the Jews and you had, you know, um, you know, like all these different groups, it was for the most part a monocultural society. It was a desert Arab culture in which all the people had to know each other. Um, you didn't have dozens of different populations living in the same metropole that you do in cities today with different histories, languages, cultures, and so on. I mean, even when Islam spread throughout the world, I mean, yes, it was a, it was multicultural on a global scale, right? But for the most part, South Asian Muslims live in, lived in South Asia. Persian Muslims lived in Persia. Chinese Muslims made up the majority of Muslims in China, right? And even if you're a Muslim who moved from one place to another, you, ex, you were expected to assimilate into that, into that culture, right? You know, so, and even when they did, you can even see like, you know, when Muslims moved as a group from one, you know, place to the next, they kind of, they actually created their own ethnic uh, enclaves. So when it comes to converts of European descent, our families, for the most part, don't want to talk to Muslims and vice versa, especially in places like UK and France, where you have two populations, our co-religionists and our co-ethnics, who have basically been at each other's throat, you know, for centuries. And even if you put them in the same room, it's probably going to turn into a huge argument within a few minutes. So. The best solution, in our opinion, is to get those converts from European descent to form their own organization, to be able to handle the very challenging task of ameliorating the convert's relationship with their family, with their permission, right? And without this, I mean, yes, the convert, especially, you know, the white convert to Islam can offer a lot in terms, you know, of, of indirectly helping the Muslim community. Um, but, you know, you have to help yourself before you help others, right? Um, and without forming a wolf pack, I mean, it's just not going to work. Right. And for Ad to ask, you know, like first generation masjids, you know, to take on this task is just not going to be feasible for them. You don't have the money, the time, they don't have the money, the time, the resources, the wherewithal to do this themselves. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of white converts are, they buy into the Medina model full stop, you know, just because another reason is that they don't see what these Muslim sub communities are like. And this was me, you know, I con when I converted to, in, to Islam in 2003, I thought we were all just one big happy family, you know, that, you know, like Arabs and Pakistanis and Somalis all hung out together and you can all put them in the same room and basically everything will be fine. And, you know, all families are going to work, you know, just like they did in Medina, you know, and, it, and it's an enticing prospect, but it's a utopia. Um, and I think why non-white Muslims or, you know, Muslims from different backgrounds, they're not white, um, support us so much is that they realize that these differences exist, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the major reasons why a lot of the European descendant converts who follow the Medina model have this knee jerk reaction to what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and then to talk about, <laughs> I know it's a sensitive talk, but to talk about intercultural marriage, we've never suggested that converts um, shouldn't marry born Muslims. We're not here to tell people who to marry, right? Um, if you want to marry, if, you know, and like this is already happening already. I mean, most converts marry into uh, born Muslim families and you can understand why. I mean, they've been rejected from their family and their society and they want a Muslim family to take them in um, and provide them the support that they need, right? Um, you know, and, you know, I can understand why a lot of, um, white converts to Islam, when we tell them like, look, it's better for most converts to Islam to marry another convert from the same culture. Um, I could see why they have this knee jerk, you know, 
um, vehement uh, denial and re reaction to that because um, they themselves are already in an intercultural marriage. So, I mean, they, I mean, that right off the bat, you know, um, it's like an affront uh, to what they've done and who they married. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of them, they don't see, a lot of them, they run like these massive Islamic organizations and they don't see the, you know, what happens at the ground level a lot of times. They don't see a lot of the converts who have converted to Islam, take their shahada, and then a couple months later, you don't see them anymore. They don't see that most of these marriages have ended in divorce, in very ugly divorce. And that's not to say that's because, you know, the born Muslim spouses are doing that it's their fault. I mean, I think it's there's a lot of culpability on both sides. And, you know, even when you had the most, I've seen personally myself, the most nicest born Muslim married the most nicest convert, and it still ends in divorce, you know, because they're just not ready to live up to these challenges that they're not aware of all these differences that are going to occur. Right. And then usually when it ends a divorce, the, the convert ends up leaving the Muslim community or many times Islam uh, altogether. Um, and I think, you know, even for, let's take it from an Islamic perspective, you know, you know, we've been <laughs> when we first converted to Islam, you know, since people push the Medina model so much, um, they really swept the Islamic aspect or Sunnah of Kafa uh, under the rug. Um, and Kafa, you know, what um, it's mustahab or uh, recommended to marry someone who is your quote unquote befit mate or your kuf, uh, someone who's similar in culture, uh, language, uh, geographic distance, uh, religiosity, um, you know, lineage, um, profession. So these are all factors that come into play. And it has nothing to do with racism, um, but, you know, it's for having a happier, more compatible marriage, right? So in the Hanafi Madhab, the Hanbali Madhab and the Shafi Madhab, Kafa is an established Sunnah. The Maliki Madhab is the only holdout, the, they only look at religiosity. But that was still in place during the Prophet Sallallahu's time. You know, even when people just traveled on foot, and for the most part, it, you know, people lived in homo culturally homogenous societies, there were still these differences that mattered to people. Even when the when the Muhajirun married the Ansar, there were still cultural differences, right? Um, so, you know, like, um, and we didn't know about this, you know, like uh, I remember taking a class uh, in university, um, an al Maghrib class, and one of the, and the teacher who was a Hanafi sheikh, you know, one of the Muslim students asked like, you know, converts marrying into another culture, like sometimes the family will reject them because um, they said that, you know, there's too many cultural differences. And they asked, can the family do this? Is this racist? And the, uh, the sheikh was very based. He said, yeah, that's perfectly fine. The, the father can actually reject the marriage of, a, of his daughter to a potential suitor if he feels that the cultures won't match. And this created a lot of fur, you know, a fear within the, the Muslim students. You know, they said, oh, well, this is racist and stuff. And he actually recommended that converts actually, you know, form their own sub communities. Okay, so um, that's uh, part one of, you know, um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this subject. In part two, I'm going to talk about uh, the second model uh, that, you know, like white converts usually get into. And this is kind of like the second narrative that's come up recently within uh, uh, Muslim communities. Um, and we'll talk about, um, you know, potential solutions uh, to that and our pitch as to why we think um, Islam for Europeans model is the best way forward, not just for uh, converts themselves uh, from whatever background you're from. Uh, but also the Muslim community at large. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.